All right, welcome to the Great Minds Podcast. This is Derek. This is Vaughn. And we're here with Dr. Sophia Webb. How are you? What's going on? I'm great. How are you doing? Good. Going great. Good. We're good. Pleasure to have you. Definitely. So just um, a brief introduction about Sophia. She is the owner of Ver- Brilliant Smiles Pediatric Dent- Dentistry in Newark, New Jersey. She's an art collector, uh, master negotiator, hustler, and overall dope person. So uh, welcome. It's an honor. Yay. Let's go. Nice to be here, guys. <laughs> All right. So we're going we gonna to get right into it. Um, so you're the owner of your own um, dentistry uh, building or... Um, so why did you get into dentistry? You know, <laughs> you know, growing up, I grew up, I'm born and raised right here in North New Jersey. Yep. And growing up, you know, back in the 80s, it was like, you know, if you were like a nerd, like I was, it was like, are you going to be a doctor? Are you going to be a lawyer? Like, what is it that you're going to do? Uh, you're going to be a teacher? You know, what is it that you want to do? And so I always, I grew up wanting to be a gynecologist. And I was like, I want to deliver babies. This is going to be great. But I went on a mission trip in Guatemala. And I went with a bunch of doctors, a bunch of dentists. And there was one dentist from the Dominican Republic that was on the trip. And she didn't need a translator. So I got to shadow her the whole time. And she was like, you know, if you become a dentist, you can make a really good living. You work nine to five. If you want to be, you know, a mom, a wife or whatever, then you have, you know, a lot of free time to do other things. And you don't have to be on call a lot. And I was like, all right, I'm sold. <laughs> and, um, so I applied to dental school and the rest is history. Yeah. Wow, that's a good point. I never thought about it that way, though. Because, you know, you do work typical dentists. They work a nine to five. And if you were a gynecologist, you know, you'd be on call. Ain't no nine to five. <laughs> Ain't no nine Not to five. Yeah. I never thought about it like that. Wow. Yeah. Definitely. So I know that you opened up in Newark, right? So what's the importance of that? I think, you know, it was good to tell that story to why out of all places you picked. Pretty, pretty much home to open up everything. I mean, I figure why not? I think our generation in particular, we're, we're really able to kind of view gentrification in like live time. Hmm. Uh, I went to Howard for dental school and I started there in 2004, 2005. And by the time I finished residency in 2013, the entire demographic, you know, around Howard University was just completely different, you know. It's, it's still Chocolate City. It'll always be Chocolate City. But I mean, it just was crazy with real estate in the area, you know, people being pushed out, more people, you know, that went to the suburbs initially came back that were not people of color, that were not native Washingtonians. And so I kind of saw the same trend in Newark. And I was just like, well, you know, I'm gonna stay here. And all my friends think I'm crazy. They're like, oh, man, you know, you need to get out, you know, you should move somewhere else and you know other places are great too but i'm just i'm too dedicated i'm a total norcad that's what's up yeah did you, with that. did you pick howard for a specific reason did you or well i said the first school to let me in i was going to <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm, going, I'm going to thomas edison uh <laughs> dental first academy said, yes i say yes okay, okay. done deal all right so so you know, for me, and I know a lot of people experience like dentists, you know, going to the dentist is like one of the worst place places to go. Not to and, me. And, 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 you know, I have my, I have my own story and, and people can tell you horror stories about um, the dentist. Now, how do you, how do you make that uh, a place that's like comfortable, especially for kids? Yeah, well, so I was a general dentist for one year. <laughs> and it was great, you know, it was cool, but um, I actually didn't want to do pediatric dentistry. I had no interest in it whatsoever. I wanted to do root canals. I was like, oh man, like this is great. Or like gum surgery. I was really good at that. Oh my goodness, I loved it. But my first job was in one of the schools in Newark. So Newark, I was working for a company called JRMC and they have clinics inside of school. So they have like a doctor, they have a dentist there. And that was my first job out of residency and I loved it. And I was, I just went back to school to specialize because I just loved it that much. And it fits me perfectly. If I was a general dentist or an oral surgeon, I probably would have quit a long time ago. I've been doing this. I've been a dentist for 11 years. 
but I, I love pedo because it's, it allows me to be my quirky self, right? I don't even look like a dentist when I'm at work. <laughs> I, I, I look like I'm, I can sit right, right in the waiting room with my patients and their parents. And I feel like I'm really approachable. I really try to have as much fun as you can have at the dentist. And it just fits my personality perfectly. I think, I think that's key because um, I'm not going to get to a whole story I had. But uh, when I was in high school, I had a really rough ex experience with a dentist. Um, so, again, I, I think that a dentist is, you know, their approach needs to be, like, soft or um, bubbly. Like, the dentist I had, he was built like an NFL linebacker. So ooh, and, ooh, and his approach was the same way. So um so I think it's great that that you are like that because you know there was a while that you know I didn't want to go to the dentist because that's all I remembered from it. So that's I think funny. that's I think that's dope that you take that approach because it, it is necessary. That's definitely funny because I've I've probably had my first root canal when I was 10. So I went through that mm -hmm. process 10 in high school. I had gum surgery because the root canal uh, that I had when I was 10, the crown cracked, and I didn't want to tell anybody. So I was in school, and I'm like, wow, I can't, I can't, it took me an hour to eat a sandwich, right? No. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, Something, something's up. So I didn't, want to, I didn't want to tell my parents, like, I don't want to go to the dentist. And then they're like, no, we got to take you in here to have gum surgery. So I go in, and I wasn't afraid of that. So once I had this done, I'm not afraid of anything with a dentist at all. They actually gave me a couple of needles, right? And the first needle that they gave me, a tear came out of my eye. I might have been 16 years old, it just dropped out. And they shot it at the roof of my mouth. And all the pain, it, it went right to the tooth. I thought my tooth was going to jump out my head. So once that happened, I said, oh, I could take anything. So now I'm like, all right, dentist, okay, what you got to do? Let's do it. It doesn't bother me at all. But the experience I had with that dentist, he was really calm and cool. He said, listen, it's going to hurt. You're going to feel it and let me know. I'm all about nummy, nummy, nummy. Give me more and more. I don't care if my more mouth more. is droopy. Just keep giving it, giving it to me, giving it to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to feel nothing. Yeah, the Bobby Brown mouth in there. Yeah, the Bobby Brown jaw. Don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. I don't want to feel anything. So yeah. I just understand that. You're like the perfect patient. We love to see you come in. We're like, oh, yes. Get in here. Have a seat. But, um, yeah, but most of my patients are fantastic, actually. A lot of people always ask me, like, oh, isn't it hard? You see little kids. You have to do a lot of work on them. They are so easy. The parents, yeah, that's a different story. But the kids, oh, they're my favorite age is age three, four, and five. Wow, I can do like a root canal crown on a four year old, they won't cry. Wow, that's wow. good without well, laughing at. So, I mean, I just you have to really love it to be good at it. Yeah, definitely. What's a what's a uh, like a crazy story you have with a patient, whether it's like when you were doing your schooling or general or. No, 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 no names, no names. No names. You know. oh, yeah, no. I, well, I would say like the saddest story, and I mean, I got so many. It's it's crazy, but I think the the craziest story. I wish I had pictures to show you. Was this little boy? He had recently immigrated from the Philippines with his dad, and he was three years old. Every tooth in the mouth was just like, mm. I mean, it was terrible. So babies have. Babies in up to age like six, they have 20 teeth. I had to extract 16 teeth. Oh, wow. So he only had four teeth left and they were in the back. Uh, hopefully, you know, they were able to stay a long time. I don't work at that place anymore, so I haven't seen him in years. But that probably was like the worst, um, like the worst case visually. But at the end of the day, it was great because he didn't have infection in his mouth. Yeah. He was able to, you know probably pay attention in school better and, and just be all around happier. But, you know, it was definitely a devastating thing to like, and it was fresh. I was fresh out of residency when I had to do this. I was wow. like, oh man, it didn't make me feel good at all. But most of the stories are great stories. You know, it's, it's really, really like a super fun job. Yeah. I, I tell people, you don't have, you don't know any pain until you had tooth pain. Facts. And I tell people, so some people get lucky, never have a, a cavity, never have any issues with their mouth. I'm like, listen, you don't understand the pain that that can do. That'll make you do some serious things. I've seen people, it's a story, I don't know if we're going to go about topic, but there's a story of, about a couple of years ago, a lady, um, she was in Nyack, I think Nyack or uh, somewhere upstate New York. And she took a bottle, she had a bad toothache allegedly, and she, she started drinking to numb the pain. 
and drove the wrong way on the highway and and, and died. Wow. wow. And killed like her, her kids, everything. People didn't understand what happened. And they said she had no issues with mental health, everything, that was all good. But they said she had a real bad toothache. And when I heard the story, I watched it, it's like a documentary on HBO, I watched it, I'm like, you know what? She was in, in her right mind at the time. If you have a, she had a serious abscess in her mouth, it was like, that affects oh, your yeah. brain. That goes to your head. So oh, people yeah. don't understand how serious tooth pain is. I mean, a 10 year old boy, a Diamante driver in Maryland, uh, right when I was going into residency, actually passed away due to um, an infection that was started by um, one of his upper teeth. Mm -hmm. So it's a very serious thing. You know, people always assume it's just a baby tooth, it's going to fall out, um, and they will fall out, but they don't fall out as quickly as you think they do. And so it's extremely important for everyone to take their child to the dentist by age one and preferably a pediatric dentist because I went to school for two extra years on top of dental school just to be trained to treat children. So taking your child to a pediatric dentist is gonna reduce the, the chance that they'll be traumatized should they need something done. Um, even if your dentist is great and they're your family dentist, they're wonderful, take your child to see a pediatric dentist, preferably me. But if not me, <laughs> you know, if you don't want the best for your child, take them to somewhere else. But take them to a pediatric dentist. That's all you if you want to get the second best, then do your thing, right? You know, exactly, man. exactly. All right, I, so go ahead, Vaughn. No, I was going to say one more thing I want to bring up. I know that we talked we talked briefly previously about, um, about Newark, but can you go into how you were able to get that building? Because I think that that's something that's so that's big, you know, to be your age to have your own, you know, practice, that's huge. So can you get into that a little bit? Well, it's a really interesting story. So at first, I, when I got out of school, I moved to South Jersey. I worked for a company for one year. And then I just wanted to move back home, be closer to my grandparents. And so I moved back home and I had an opportunity with a developer in Newark to be where I currently am. But at the time the deal wasn't right. And I mean, it was a fair deal. It just was so expensive, you know? And, and at the time I really just didn't have the dough to do it. And it was severely overpriced and kind of ahead of the market in my opinion, which is worth what? Like I'm not an expert, but it just was out of range for me. So I wasn't, a, I wasn't afraid to walk away from the table and that's what I did. Maybe a year later, the same developer approached me and they had a, a better deal on the table, right? It was, okay, you know, this is what we're going to provide to you, and this is how you're going to, you know, kind of pay us back in a way. It, it still wasn't the right deal. So I was like, sounds good, but sorry, you know, no nah. thank you. I'm not with it. But then the actual deal that I got was, and I'm not going to name them because um, if other tenants see it, they may get a little pissed off. Yeah, but pretty, pretty I'll, I'll much. say this, you know, to build the office, um, it, it's typically around $110 per square foot. And my office is 2,150 square feet. Mm -hmm. And I probably was responsible for building maybe like 10% of that. Um, okay. So, yeah, I got That's a great, great. deal. That's great. got a great deal. Uh, okay. Yeah, it was I, great. I was just about to ask you, um, you know, in our pre-meet, you said that you were the master negotiator oh yeah um what's what's something you negotiated or why why do you how did you earn that title my grandmother printed out an article years ago and it said that women in the workplace are not paid the same as men because they don't ask for it mm -hmm. right and to be honest so many times you know you get so timid when it's time to talk about money because you don't want to be you want to be like that altruistic person. Oh, it's not all about money. I love the kids, you know, like, and you're just so scared to, to get paid. Like you, you can't be afraid to get to the bag. Mm -hmm. So I was working for a job. The one that I just briefly said when I was working in South Jersey and there was like some sort of problem with the system. And one day I got paid $15 for two weeks worth of work. And I was just like, Whoa, you know, like this is just unacceptable. And so on their computer, I typed up a resignation letter and then I faxed it to the corporate office and was like, you know, I'm out of here. And they didn't really care, right? They have dentists come in all the time. And so had to give a 90 day notice on like day 88. They were like, oh, Dr. Webb, you know, people love you. You should stay. And I'm like, I have another job. I, I can't stay. So I started working the new job and, um, and then they kept hitting me up because 
the place is really remote since South Jersey, um, like really in the sticks. And they really needed me to come back bad. And so I was sitting with my grandmother and I was just like, you know, I was emailing back and forth, like, you know, I really can't come back. And they were like, you know, well, what, what is it going to take for you to come back? So I was like, aim high, shoot high. <laughs> I was like, well, I would, I need a car. I need a place to stay. Cause I live in Newark. You want me to go to South Jersey? And I, requested double my pay and so before I sent like send my grandmother was like whoa whoa <laughs> like whoa take it easy you know like I think that's a little much and I was like well I honestly don't want to go back and work for them so I'm just gonna like shoot for the stars and I sent it and, like five minutes later they were like okay yep so you hit them with the flex package definite <laughs> I mean I was surprised and then I mean I, I didn't plan on taking the job but when they said yes I was like damn Okay. I'll take it I'll, now, yeah. You know what it is too, I'm like, going back. and and then after you, after they accept that that easily, you like, wow, like they were playing me the whole time. And yeah. that's why I was like, okay, what am, what am I really doing, you know? And so from that point on, uh, what I requested was on the higher end of what people are getting, maybe like after being a dentist for like five or ten years, and I was only out one year. And so every other job that I've had after that is that's just been my baseline, and I haven't had any problems. So. Um, I'm a professor at Rutgers, and I also teach at Newark Beth Israel, and people are always asking, I always do a lecture on negotiating for your first job, yeah. and the residents really love that lecture, and they're always like, but how did you, but when did you, how are you able to say that? And I'm like, yes, yeah, say it. Yeah. Well, it's a, it, it's a weird conversation because it's like, especially if it's a job you really want, and you're just like, I don't want to lose the job because I'm asking for too much, or... Yeah. Um, so, so it was definitely a weird situation. And I think it helped your situation when one, like they totally insulted you, you yeah. know, with that, with that check. So that helped you. And two, you I, had leverage. Yeah. I mean, I think whenever you're negotiating anything, you have to know what you're worth, right? Yeah, you know can't, worth, yeah. I, I'm not, I don't, I didn't do anything that was so outrageous. That was just like, I didn't deserve it. No, I earned it. You know, it was like, you have to know what you're bringing to the table. And if you're bringing like a hundred to the table and somebody's giving you 20, it's not enough. You know, you need to talk to get up to close to that hundred. And I, I don't think it's, you know, I think it's leveraged in a way that I was good at my job, right? I got along with everyone. The patients loved me. I was respectful to everyone. And, you know, I was a good employee. So I wasn't afraid to ask for that. It wasn't like they were giving me anything. Like, no, I was like busting my hump and I earned every quarter, you know? So you have to know what you're capable of. Now you can't be like a lackluster, lazy exactly. person and then walking in and saying, nah, this is what I want ABC. You're not gonna get it, you know? But if you're at the top of your game and you're really, really going in, like you better ask for what you're worth. That's I think the problem, the problem with people is too, especially, I hate to say a lot of, I would say minorities in general and mm -hmm. um, women too, because we all know it's always a short change game when it comes to, especially in corporate America. So yeah. we always see it. I see it all the time. I know it. And it's about knowing your worth, too. And I think a lot of people don't know their worth or they're afraid to say their worth. And like you yeah. said, if you know what you're doing, you know what you're worth, you say it. And then if they don't respect it, then you make a move. Um, yeah. But I think it's you extra hard. Can't be afraid hard. to walk away. Can't be. I think it's extra hard, too, especially for a female, too. And I, I, just me seeing it, being a male and watching how it goes. Yeah. Because if you, if you have a strong, a strong female, a strong African-American female, they could get labeled as she's hard to work with mm -hmm. or she or, or or she's causing a problem when really she's not causing a problem. I you just want the appropriate bag. Yeah, that's what the appropriate yeah. bag for what I'm doing. So it's a way that I we mean have it does to, help to like walk in with my hair like this in a pair of converse on like, sorry man, not gonna work. <laughs> not gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> but they definitely you definitely have an extra <laughs> hurdle to get over all the time. So I think yeah. you knowing your work and giving those lectures to, to um, people that look just like us. And just people, you know, yeah. that helps them a lot, you know. And you just have to exercise your, you know, your negotiation muscle. At the end of the day, like, you're not going to win every negotiation. You're not going to come out on top in every situation. But it's a learning experience, right? Like, you can be 32 years old, lose it all, and gain it back in two years. You can't be afraid to kind of, like, go out on a limb. And yep. not, it's, not, it's not for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Like, everyone's personality... Some people really need that stability and it's like they need to be able to see long term. 
And I mean, do I need that now? I'm a mom, so like, yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. When I became a mom, I was like, man, I well, don't you, have anything. Like, you know I what don't. It is too? It's also, I think, it's our generation too, because yeah, like our, our generation before us, like our moms and dads, and even grand grandparents, they would stay at one job for like thirty years and yeah. never leave it. Right? Like, I'm here. You get get a, get a good government job, a good blah 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 blah. Yeah. Right? Nowadays, we're like, no, we can go so many other places. So we move around and we kind of yeah. look for the best fit for us. And I think we need to start, meaning people in general care more about, don't put anybody above your family and, with, and, and yeah. your needs. Some people do that. They'll work at a job and they're like, oh, it's comfortable. I don't want to leave. Or, I was yeah. always told when you get too comfortable somewhere, that's when it's time to like, all right, what's going on? You gotta start something. Yeah. You would try to advance up, try to go somewhere because com- yeah. comfortable isn't isn't the way to way to be. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna transition a little bit. I see you with the art pieces, yes. um, and you're loving art. That, that's some dope art in the back in the background there. Um, what type of art pieces do you seek when you go out? Um, uh, I mean to be honest, like I've only been collecting a few years. Okay. And uh, a great inspiration was actually this guy I met on Instagram, this guy out of Chicago, whose art collection is just ridiculous. His name is uh, Diallo. And, um, you know, I got a lot of advice from him. But really, one of the things that he told me, this was early on, maybe like, I would say three, four years ago, he was like, buy what you like, right? And I think so many people, especially us, we want to buy what's hot, you know? whatever looks fly, like whatever your friend got, you want to get, but really, you know, really being passionate about the arts, like whether it's music, whether it's, you know, a painting, whether it's poetry, you really just got to get into what you like, figure out what's right for you and what your aesthetic is. And, you know, what are you doing it for? Like some people just collect because they just want it in their home. Some people collect because they want to resell later. And some people just want to flip it right away. I'm not a flipper. Um, I probably, I mean, I may sell some things, you know, when my daughter gets bigger, but for me, I buy it because I like it. I want it in my home and, and that's that. Uh, but I'm cheap. Like, you know, I, I'm not one of those people that's gonna, you know, follow the crowd and like pay top dollar for something just because it's hot right now. I'm just, I'm just not going to do that. But I had to, again, it's a learning experience, right? In the beginning, man, I was a sucker. (laughs) <laughs> but not no more. <laughs> well, the, funny thing, the funny thing about art is all subjective, right? So it's like yeah. if you see a picture, it could be a picture of a of a, of grass, right? <laughs> yeah. And someone could say, "I think that's worth ten dollars." Someone else could say, "No, it's worth a thousand dollars." And yeah. someone else could say, "Oh, those are for a hundred thousand dollars, right?" So it's all about h- how much you feel to pay for it. So that's why they always yeah. I've always heard that when you look at art, it's not really the price tag. It's how what's what you're willing to pay for it. Exactly. That's how much it's worth. To you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Exactly. There's this one piece that I have, and this was early on, like probably the second like art dealer that I met. And um, I was I met a guy on Amtrak. I was going to DC and we were just talking at the time. I was like talking a lot about guitar. And I was like, oh man, do you know any guitar players? Like, I need some lessons. I mean, I just suck the guitar. I probably still do. But I I was just rapping to this guy. And so we ended up exchanging information. And so we would text like every once in a blue moon, I would say, oh, you know, what's going on in the city? He's a photographer. And so one day I hit him up like, hey, do you know any people that deal black art? And so he connected me with a guy in Brooklyn. And I went to the guy's studio and he started talking to about an artist named Nathaniel Mary Quinn. So he's like, oh, this is a cat out of Chicago. He told me this story, like he was abandoned by his family. His mother passed away. I connected with the story, you know, both of my parents passed away when I was a teenager. So I really connected with, you know, the story of the artist and he like pulls out this piece and the piece was cool. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't what I was going there to buy, but I, I liked it and I looked at it and he was like, um, yeah, it was going to be like $1,700. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it's a piece of paper. Like, like at the end of the day, you, you told me about this guy and it's cool and it, it he signed it and it's numbered but you know like and then i thought like man i've wasted so much money on just bs you know like eh, i'm gonna jump out the window on this one okay so i ended up getting the piece um for around that amount 
<laughs> and I got it framed and you know, it's, it's actually in my house. I'm looking at it right now. And maybe I would say like four months ago, I was just like, oh man, like this artist, I was trying to get an original. And I mean, the price for an original is just, I mean, who can afford that? Like 30, 40, $50,000. Yeah. So I was like, all right, well, that ain't going to happen. So I was like, well, I wonder how much people are selling this for. So I look online. So I find a gallery that has some of the prints. So I, I reached out, made an inquiry. And they were like, they were selling it for $18,000. Mm. The one you bought for $1,700? Yeah. Oh, around around $1,700. Around. Okay. Around. That's dope. But, That's dope. you know, um, but I mean, I didn't buy it to sell it. But now, you know, are they really getting that for it? No. I mean, they're probably getting close to, th to 10 or whatever someone, you know, wants to pay for it. But it's about educating yourself, right? So this particular artist, I think the reason why I went so high, he signed to a major gallery. Um, well, he's always been signed to a great gallery, but he signed with Gagosian right now. And that is like elite, elite, elite. And so it's the only print that he's made. All of his other pieces are originals. So people that are true collectors, they want that piece, right? Because right. it's just his only print. And so that's why the price went up. But it, would I pay something like, absolutely not. It's, <laughs> would you guys pay something like that for it? No, nah, probably not. Absolutely not. Absolutely um, not. But, but yeah, but it's, it's all about, um, you know, what you're collecting mm -hmm. for, what's your reason behind it. And for me, it's all about like a story too, right? Like I love to go antiquing. And so part of the thrill for me is like, oh, like I, I have these old school mammy dolls, right? It's like back in the day, mm -hmm. um, you have people that, you know, in slavery. And I went to this place, I was on the road coming from DC and it was just like a place where they had tons of barns and thrift stores. And so I bought these two mammy dolls and a straightening comb. It was like no black people in sight for like, <laughs> I mean, I see, I had to buy it. Cause I was like, I cannot allow someone who's not black to have it, <laughs> like I have to have it, you know? Yeah. And I paid nothing for it. I mean, it's, I, I don't know how much it's worth. I'm not interested in figuring out if it's worth anything, but it's just the thrill of the story for me. And I have it on display and I'm like, if someone asks me about it, I'm like, oh, actually yeah. I was blah, 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 you know? So for me, that's what it's about. And well, it's not about showing off or, you know, it's just, it's just for me. Yeah. yeah. But I've done some pretty crazy things to acquire art though. I have really? to say. Yeah. Like what? Like what? Um, well, one is not so, it's not as, as crazy as it may seem. Uh, the guy that I met on Instagram, one day we were like talking on the phone and I had never met him in person. It was just like, we would talk and he was like, oh, you know, um, there's this Banksy hotel that's in, um, in Palestine, in Bethlehem. And it's going to be like an uh, anniversary to the year that they open in a, in a few weeks. Like you should go. And I was like, I should go. So I called <laughs> up one of my best friends uh, from dental school and we like booked a last minute trip and we went, we flew to Tel Aviv and then we went through the border. We went into Bethlehem. Like, oh, you know, I sat on a mountain on the side of, in Jericho. I mean, it was just, it's just random. And so some of the things that I bought when I was on that trip, it's just cool, you know, not because, oh, I, you know, not about money or anything about how much it may be worth, but it's just more so like, wow, like I, I floated in the Dead Sea and and at the at the tree in Jericho where Zacharias, where Jesus walked by, like I bought it at a flea market that's under this tree. How cool yeah. is that? You know, the, the, the story yeah. behind it is crazy. It's le yeah. it, levels. Yeah. yeah. So that that's what it is for me. It's you know, but I don't knock anybody that just you know. I don't knock the stunt kings. I mean, do what you do, enjoy. But yeah. for me, it's more about like the journey to getting there. Gotcha. I, I would say you could went to Canal Street and cop, and cop something. <laughs> I could. Do you know? Like, uh, I don't. I don't know how many years ago. Maybe close to ten years ago. Banksy. I. I don't know if it was Canal Street, but it was like this. Um, you know, just like those little carts that they have. Yeah. And it was all original, like Banksy pieces. People had maybe purchased for $30, $60, depending on the size wow. that you wanted. And it was just spray painted like a rat or something. <laughs> and come to find out they were authentic pieces. And like, mm. they're selling now 20K. People pay like 30 bucks for it. Wow, oh, that's crazy. That's yeah, real. so again, you buy what you like, you know. And I think that that particular artist, he's really passionate about that because... 
you know, if you like it, you're going to spend $20 on it. If you know it's a real piece, then you're going to be clamoring. But if you don't know and you're just like, oh, I like that. So, yeah. I mean, I kind of, that's just the way I do it. You know? well, I think it's a win-win too. Like if you, if you buy it because you like it, if nothing pops off from it, like at the end of the day, you like it anyway. Exactly. You can hold on to it. And if something crazy happens, then you got to let it go for a good amount of bread. Then that, that's great. Then that, that's wonderful. It's a win-win. Yeah. Well, I think most artists are like that too. It's like for the whole starving artist thing. I think they do it. They're not doing it for the money anyway. Most of, most artists aren't doing it for the money. They kind of just saying like, all right, if you want to pay twenty bucks, pay twenty bucks. If yeah. you want to pay twenty thousand, I'm not gonna stop you. Exactly. But but I think too, it's like you know, people be selling the lifestyle, right? Mm-hmm. So people, you know, they come off. Oh, they they you know they're hobnobbing and. You know, they're like so elite and so cool and that works for them and that's great. And I probably like double tap on a gram and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. But for me, you know, first of all, I'm black, grew up in Newark. Like I could, you know, if I have extra money to just throw at art like that, thousands and thousands of dollars, I can probably funnel that back through into my community yeah. instead of trying to buy like a status symbol to yeah. look cool so some you know i like to joke around and say like oh i'm cheap but it's just like if i had just like you know a hundred thousand dollars just laying around i'm not gonna buy something that's you know an object that could be destroyed god forbid in a fire oh. uh, when i can take that extra money and help people that look just like me uh get to where they want to be in life you know get way beyond that where i can ever go yep so definitely I'm definitely sorry. um one other thing I want to get into, how has motherhood changed you? Like your work, your perspective. Like mm-hmm. I know you mentioned about like how you were, you know, more willing to move from jobs because you're just like, it's just me, whatever. But yeah. now, you know, it, it, it's perspective. So how was it, how has it changed you? It, it's made me a little bit more careful. Like, you know, before I would be like, you know what, like, this job isn't, I'm not feeling it. And I would just be like, all right, I'm gonna find one next week. And I would really just like do it, you know? And it it was cool. Like, you know, I was responsible with my money, but now that I'm a parent, it's like, it's not just me, right? Like I'm fine eating peanut butter and jelly. I'm fine eating a tuna fish sandwich, but you know, if things all fall apart, but you know, I have this little person and I can't let things fall all the way apart. So with that being said, you know, I haven't bought any art in a while, <laughs> but I think I got a pretty good stash already. Trust me, she, she's going to start making you art yourself and you're going to put it on your refrigerator. So I know, be right? It'll be worth you know, I'm anything. really sad. It, Mother's Day just passed and it's my first Mother's Day. Yeah. And, you know, I my daughter goes to daycare because, you know, I, I have to work full time. And I was looking forward to like that cheesy Mother's Day gift. You know, like the handprint, the macaroni, like I was so ready and I didn't get to get it. So I'm a little sad, but she is returning this week for two days because I have something to do. And I'm going to request that they make me a Mother's Day gift. There you go. However you get it, right? You know, I really wanted it. Cause I, and then my friends were like, oh, you can just make it with her. I'm like, no, I want to be surprised. Oh, you got to be surprised. Yeah. You know, I, I want to see what it is. I'm like, I was looking forward to it. Yeah. And you're right, Vaughn, because I was going to frame it and everything. Like, That's the art. Yep. That's the yeah. art right there. I did have a question, too. You know, with the whole COVID-19 stuff going on that we're we all concerned about right now. Oh, um, yeah. how, how do you see your business or your office changing in the midst of that when everything is you know when we're kind of open again I guess you can say well it's kind of good and bad for my specific situation my office opened in February I was only open for 28 days before I had to shut down due to the coronavirus so it's bad in that man I was just getting started you know I didn't really have time to generate enough revenue to really weather a storm like this but at the same time it's good because You know, my employees are not stuck in their ways. I'm not stuck in my ways. So it's just, dentistry is just going to be really different. You know, before I can accommodate like four patients at a time in my office, Um, I have room for six chairs, but I can really fill four. But now with social distancing, it's really, you know, you really have to be meticulous with scheduling, getting people in, getting people out before, you know, mom, dad, grandma, 
godmother would come to the appointment now it's like one parent you mm. know and then it's like if the child is old enough if they're well behaved then the parent can't sit in the room because social distancing is three of us in here this room is what like 10 feet by 12 feet you know it, it's not safe for all of us to be here uh, but i did prepare my office and we have uh, you know suctioning systems we have lots of PPE, we have N95 masks. So, you know, we're definitely dedicated to keeping everyone safe. Like, you know, I'm trying to keep my family safe, I want my employees to be safe, my patients to be safe. So it was just a different way of practicing. So it, like I said, it's good and bad because, you know, I, I didn't really get into a really good flow on my own because I was only open for four weeks. Yeah, so, wow, wow. Yeah. Ah. All right, so we're going to move into our, our rapid fire section that we like to do with our guests. Um, <laughs> this is fun, trust me. No, nothing crazy. Just uh, a couple a couple of simple rules. Um, there's one answer. There's no context. The answer is the answer. Okay. And um, no Googling. We're just going to go. All right. Okay. <laughs> don't ask me nothing off the Wonderlick test. I don't know. Nah, I we, we will not do that. I promise. You. All right. Here we go. All right. Anita Baker or Patty LaBelle? Anita. Jay Z tickets or Giants tickets? Jay Z. Hmm. It's gonna be a lot of eye candy at a concert. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, one's got to go permanently, art or music? Oh, shit. Art. Ooh. Okay. So you watch Ozark. I say that. I did, yeah. Okay, Ruth or Wendy? Oh, Ruth, man. Okay. Ruth. <laughs> All right, here's my last one. Joe Exotic or Carol Baskins? Joe. This is my boy, Joe. <laughs> Free Joe. <laughs> Free Joe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Starks or Oakley? John Starks, man. I knew she was going to see John Because right. light skin guys was in back then anyway. <laughs> 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 so, um, definitely a pleasure having you on. This oh, my pleasure. Thank you um, very much. Thank you very much. I think you are a um, great example for, you know, everybody, girls, girls everybody, <laughs> entrepreneurs. And I don't want to lock you into a box and say um, just girls, because like, you know, especially when you talk about the negotiation and stuff like that, everybody's dealing with that. Uh, with that being said, you know, how you yourself unapologetically is dope. Hair thank goals, you. definitely. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> uh, if, I, if I could get that, those, those days, yeah. days pass me. I don't know they're gone. So. Now you finished. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate having you on. Um, My pleasure. Looking forward to hearing from you in the future. Yeah, Wonderful. hopefully open up Likewise. soon. Yeah. Hopefully yes, open up soon. Yes. Oh, actually, I'm going to be opening up on June 1st. Okay. So, That's great. Um, so yeah, so June 1st. And please, everybody out there, ladies, gentlemen, young, old, don't be afraid to ask for what you're worth, but work hard and you know, just enjoy life, enjoy the process and everything that you do. Don't do it for the gram, do it for you. Facts. Definitely. Facts. All right. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Take Later. care. All right. So Dr. Sophia Webb. Yes, um, thank you very much. Salute. Doctor. All right, so um, we're going to wrap up with our musical picks. I um, actually got two, two this week. You got two? So, right. Two. Um, so this week I got Marlon Kraft, um, MC from New York. Uh, got a pretty dope pro project called Funhouse Mirror. And my other one, um, I actually just started listening today, uh, DVSN, Amusing Her Feelings, another OVO. Toronto cat. Um, Toronto is killing the R and B game with. So is this R and B or is it or is it rap? Nah, it's R and B. So straight singing. Yeah. So he's got like right. he's got um. Toronto's killing it in the R and B scene, man. Between between him and Daniel Caesar, and the weekend and. Because Toronto's like a big melting pot too. They have yeah. a lot like because different Orlando, nationalities out there. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, yeah. They're so still up there. Marlon Kraft. And DVSN on my picks this week. 
Okay. All right, I have three. So, you know, these are not like anything new, but who I'm listening to this past week. I've listened to a lot of G-Eazy. I've been a G-Eazy fan for a minute, though. So this is before, like, all the new stuff that he's putting out. But, like, you know, from, from kind, of, kind of from the beginning, I've been mm-hmm. checking for him. Um, that West Side Gun album, I know how you feel about it, but... I, I, I could take it in... Um, I could take his music in dosages. Yeah, yeah, nothing wrong with that. But I just like his beat selection, as you stated. And I just like... It depends on kind of mood I'm in. So I've listened to his last album. And then that, that Royce allegory still. I still listen to that album. It doesn't yeah, matter. That's, de- that's definitely in the rotation, for sure. Definitely. He, he's like, to me, he might be my, my favorite MC out right now. Yeah, that's more than fair right there. Yeah, like over anybody. Yeah, next next level. Definitely. All right, so we're going to wrap. Um, thank you for watching and listening. Um, again, follow us on Instagram at The Great Minds Podcast. Um, you can search us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Everywhere. YouTube, SoundCloud, um, whatever's most convenient for you. So thank you for listening, comment, all that. Yeah, appreciate you. And shout out to um, my homie D Flame on for the shirt. Yeah, um, mine didn't come, man. <laughs> so we can, um, you can check her out at dflameon.com for merch. Yeah, thank you for you. listening. Peace.